<laughs> Laser guided udder suckers. That's something I didn't think I'd hear today or read, I guess. How's it going, guys? Welcome back to the channel. American cheese isn't cheese. We all knew that though, right? But check this out. The thumbnail says it's not even American. I thought that was American cheese, which we do have that here. But did it start somewhere else? That's what I'm curious about. As soon as I saw that thumbnail, I was like, you know what? I got it. I got to check this out. So uh, we have the original channel is Atomic Frontier. Or I'll scroll it down so you can see it. My camera's in the way. Um, yeah, and and it just is called American Cheese Isn't Cheese. So of course, the links to the original video will be in the description section down below. And we're gonna find out. We're gonna get to the bottom of this today, guys. We're gonna do some YouTube uh learning today. You're gonna learn along with me, of course. And yeah, let's check it out and find out about this because I could have swore that was American. We call it American cheese. Everybody in the world calls it American cheese, and we all know it's not real cheese. I'm not I'm not that dumb. I'm smart enough to realize the difference. Like we do have real cheese here too. Um I like it way much a lot better. Although that is good for grilled cheese because it melts really nice. It, it is nice for that. But it might not have started in America. That's what the thumbnail is suggesting. So we're going to get to the bottom of it. We're going to find out right now. American cheese isn't cheese. And in many ways, it is barely American. So just what are these questionably delicious bright orange squares? This video was brought to you by Squarespace, the website hosting platform through which to run your business. In order to understand American cheese, we first need to appreciate cheese cheese, which is what brings me to the Point Reyes Farmstead Cheese Company in Northern California. This is their robotic milking facility. A robotic milking facility? Where's the cow at? Huh. No, these aren't milking robots, they're milking cows. Because of the automated okay. system, cows are able to decide how much they get milked. <laughs> Laser guided udder suckers. That's something I didn't think I'd hear today or read, I guess. For this farm's 330 Holocenes, typically that's about three times a day, producing 10 liters or two and a half gallons of milk in every session. Okay. They're like sucking them dry. Other baby mammals, calves rely on their mother's milk in order to get all their required proteins, fats, vitamins, and minerals in order for them to grow. Their digestive systems just aren't capable of dealing with regular solid food. Right. To slow this milk's progression through their digestive systems, calves produce a series of enzymes known as rennet, which coagulate the fluid into solid curds and liquid whey. By doing this process outside the calf's body, and then pressing together the curds to drain away the whey, we get what is commonly known as cheese. Okay, so so the cow the calves are essentially almost making like cheese in their belly. That's interesting. I I didn't know that. Carefully selected cultures of bacteria will ferment the cheese, breaking down the milk proteins to give a variety of textures and flavors. With small variations in initial starting products and processing methods, we can produce a staggering variety of cheeses. Oh, wow. Okay, so we got just basic cheese. So rennet coagulated and acid coagulated. So acid coagulated makes cottage cheese, cream cheese, quark cheese, queso blanco, mold ripened. So brie, camembert, bacteria ripened. Okay, so the mold ripened is in the rennet coagulated section. We got Bacteria ripened also in that section. Then you got internal bacteria, sur uh, surface bacteria. Under the internal bacteria, you got gassy bacteria and then no gases. Wow, there's a lot of, there's a lot to it. I see here. So where, okay, so Gouda cheese, how to cheese, whatever you want to pronounce it, is rennet coated, bacteria ripened with internal bacteria with gassy bacteria in a cold room and you get Gouda. Gouda, Gouda, however, cheddar, no gases, Parmesan, no gases. Okay. Oh, you can also make Gouda with no gases. Havarti cheese. I like Havarti. That's in the surface bacteria section. Very interesting, guys. These are some of the cheeses produced at the farmstead, 
Well, globally, there are more than 2,000 varieties. Milk's high nutrient content, optimized for the needs of growing calves, means that microorganisms love cheese just as much as we do. While some natural colonies, such as the penicillin roquefort of blue cheese, add extra flavor, others, like E. coli, can cause food poisoning and even death. Yeah. Because of this, and before the advent of modern refrigeration, cheese rarely made its way outside of the community that produced it, making it unaffordable and inaccessible for most of the world's population. Okay. American cheese came along with the goal of changing that. You know, in modern days, of course, you can make any style of cheese anywhere. You just got to know which bacteria and which method to use, of course. But it's not going to be quite the same because you're not going to have the same milk, the same grass-fed cows or, or whatever it is that, you know, they're sourcing the milk from, which I would assume would change the flavor slightly. If you're anything like me, then chances are you've got a bunch of bananas in your kitchen somewhere slowly turning brown. <laughs> I got some in there that's straight black now. I was going to make banana nut bread with it. I didn't have the nuts. I was going to wait. I was going to go to the store and get nuts. I kept forgetting. They went from brown to straight black, and I'm probably going to have to toss them now. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if they're even any good anymore. With the promise of turning them into banana bread rather than just throwing them out. Right. Chances are you'll buy another bunch next week. And an I actually made some pancake or some waffles uh, with some of them, and they, they were actually really good banana waffles. Rather than just throwing them out. Chances are you'll buy another bunch next week and another the week after. In 1795, this same problem of food spoilage was getting in the way of Napoleon's conquest of Europe. Since an army marches on its stomach, getting a reliable source of safe food was of paramount importance. This prompted Napoleon to offer the 1795 equivalent of a quarter million US dollars for anyone who could solve the problem of long-term food preservation. Huh. Oh, Enter doing. French candy maker Nicolas Saper, who, with zero scientific understanding, but 14 years of just trying stuff out, discovered that by taking his rations, putting them in a glass jar, sealing it tightly, and then boiling it for five hours, they could be preserved for years at a time. Wow, so no scientific knowledge. He's just doing trial and error for, what do you say, 15 years or something? What led him to say, like, oh, I'm going to put this stuff in a jar and then boil it in water for five hours? Like, I wonder how he ended up coming to that conclusion. It works. I'm glad he figured it out. Like, canning's a thing, uh, and it's a very useful thing. But that's just interesting that somebody with no scientific knowledge or anything like that would just come to that conclusion. Tasting just as good when they went in as when they came back out again. The reason that this works is because high temperatures kill the decay-causing microbes inside the jar, while the seal stops new ones from getting in. Oh. As long as it holds, it is impossible for the food to go off, as there are no microbes to cause decay. This is the basic principle of canned food. Nice. If well, we now try you know. out this heat-based sterilization with cheese, then it separates out into an unpalatable goop. That wasn't cheese, that was a banana. Cheese is a homogeneous mixture of milk proteins, interspersed with fat globules, and of course, a lot of calcium. As cheese melts, these calcium ions force adjacent proteins to irreversibly crosslink. As they do, our fat globules get pushed out and rise to the surface. Even after the structure cools, these stay separated, and the cheese is ruined. Okay. If a pair had spent more time helping Napoleon to conquer Switzerland, rather than being in Paris making candy, then he'd have learned that the Swiss had already solved the conundrum of molten cheese a century before. How? <laughs> Fondue. Fondue is a mixture of cheese and wine, which stays homogenous even when molten. That's because the acid in the wine bonds to the cheese's calcium ions, preventing them from being involved in crosslinking. Understandably, it tastes a bit like wine, which is great, but not necessarily what you want to be feeding your soldiers. In 1911, a pair of engineers, who were appropriately Swiss, came along and substituted the wine for some sodium citrate. To show you it working, I've added some of the sodium citrate into our original cheese. Now, when we melt it, it stays homogenous. I'm confused because I could have swore I saw him put a banana in there. It, am I missing something, guys? Well, that was a banana, right, that he put in there? And when it reforms, it goes back to its original constitution. Huh. It came too late for Napoleon, but soldiers have been eating this canned processed cheese since World War I. 
You can even buy it as a civilian in Australia, where, as you can see, it still contains that sodium citrate. This one okay. doesn't need to be refrigerated and has a best before date of 2040, making it perfect for a country which routinely experiences Mad Max style societal collapse every time the price of iron ore falls. <laughs> Originally, American cheese was just this French proposed, Swiss perfected form of meltable long life cheese, often made by combining together the cheaper offcuts of cheddar, Colby, and other cheap cheeses. It was commercialized by Canadian born industrialist James Kraft while he was living in Chicago, branding it as American cheese entirely as a marketing gimmick. Oh. This is a block of. That said it was Canadian, right? Yeah. Living in Chicago. As American cheese, entirely as a marketing gimmick. This is a block of true American cheese, which I constructed using the 1916 patent. I made it with some really nice high quality cheeses, meaning that it too is delicious. As an extra bonus, the properties which allowed it to survive heat based sterilization also means that it melts beautifully into mac and cheese or on the top of a burger. Since 1900, US cheese consumption has grown from 2 to 18 kilograms per person per year. But if you used high quality cheeses to make it, so basically you're just taking other cheeses, mixing them together, doing some chemical processing or, or whatever. But if those other cheeses are originally not American cheese and they're other cheese, like cheddar comes from England, I'm pretty sure, right? Uh, Havarti's German, you know, of course, Swiss cheese is Swiss. So it's not really, we just processed it here. American processed cheese, not American cheese, right? Maybe I'm thinking about that wrong. In large part, due to the accessibility and affordability of long life American cheese. But with big growth and bigger profits comes the tendency to take some pretty disastrous shortcuts. One of the key limitations of this processed American cheese was that it still required a lot of cheese cheese in order to produce. Exactly. Now, that cheese cheese is typically pretty expensive. In the early years, they could get away with effectively free offcuts, but as demand for the American sort grew, they needed to get dedicated sources. As a lover of true proper cheese, I think that sounds like a massive waste. Kraft thought so too, but from a more economic perspective, sourcing all that cheese was getting really expensive. Now, a much cheaper dairy product is milk and in some cases butter, because these require a lot less processing. Carry gold, that is, that is good butter. Therefore, Kraft started to substitute the cheese cheese for these cheaper other dairy products. By adding in a little bit of flavor compounds, no one was any the wiser. Huh. In the mid-1990s, this substitution got taken to the extreme. Coke membrane systems had just invented polyethyl sulfone membrane. This, by the way, is a tea strainer, but should give you the right idea. It was filled with tiny holes, which were able to filter milk into its constituent components. Huh. Including Oops. a powdery protein-rich substance known as milk protein concentrate. Because milk of any quality, including exceptionally low quality, can be made into milk protein concentrate, and this concentrate can last for two years without needing to be refrigerated, as you might expect, milk protein concentrate is easy to get and exceptionally cheap. As you might have also guessed, Kraft started to substitute some of the cheese-derived milk proteins with some of these concentrate milk proteins. Cheese naturally has some variance in the amount of protein which it contains. As an extra bonus, by adding in more or less of the concentrate, differences between batches could be evened out, giving consumers a more consistent and thus more desirable product. Okay. But with all of these additions, substitutions, and processing... Yeah, that's the kind of cheese that you get here as your, as your craft cheese. Craft is just like the, the main, uh, probably the most uh, famous brand, more popular brand, but... Of course, there's different companies making it, but that's your general standard American cheese slices. It comes prepackaged in the plastic sleeves. I don't know if you guys have that over in Europe um, or Australia or, you know, whatever other countries or continents or whatever, you know, but uh, yeah. Can we still call it cheese? Fortunately, there is one place with the definite answer. <laughs> This is Title 21, Parts 100 to 199 of the US Code of Federal Regulations, 
effectively the food part of the Food and Drug Administration. Okay. Among other things, it outlines standards of identity for all the foods recognized by the US government, letting us know what must be in and what must not be in certain foods in order for them to be branded as such. Well, <clears throat> different places have different regulations because here in the United States, to be considered chocolate, it has to have 10% cocoa or cacao or whatever, however you pronounce it, right? Whereas in Europe, it has to have 30%. So like your standard Hershey's chocolate bar wouldn't be legal to be called chocolate in Europe because it only has the minimum requirement of 10%. You go to Europe and it would have to be called like imitation chocolate or chocolate flavored candy bar. They couldn't just call it chocolate because over there, it's not. Chocolate has to have 30%. So our standards are lower here. So if it's considered technically cheese by the standards of identity or whatever it is he's talking about by the you know the fda that doesn't mean that other countries would also uh consider it a, a you know technically a cheese so i think that this would only apply to the united states if you don't obey these standards then you can still sell your safe product as food but you can't label it as one of these protected categories right Let's take a look at some of the 52 pages on cheese, starting with Gorgonzola. Gorgonzola. Oh, I do like a bit of Gorgonzola. To name your cheese <laughs> Gorgonzola, it must be characterized by the presence of blue-green mold Pelicillin Rockthrot throughout the cheese. The minimum milk fat content is 50% by weight of solids, and the maximum moisture content is 42%. Effectively, that stops you selling water as cheese. We also see that it needs to be matured for 90 days. I get a pretty detailed description of the production method, as well as the temperatures and times that must be involved during that production. Okay. We get a list of optional ingredients, which you can include if you want to, but you don't have to. If you want to add something else, like wasabi, that is not on the required or optional ingredients list, then you can't sell your cheese as gorgonzola. There are two standards dealing with American cheese of relevance to us today. First of all, we have pasteurized processed cheese made of almost entirely real cheeses with a little amount of extra ingredients as required. Yeah, we get a lot of that, the pasteurized processed cheese. I might even have some in the fridge that, some, that my mom or something gave me, but. This is the original American cheese that we made earlier. We also have pasteurized processed cheese food, which allows you to add in many more milk fats and solids, as long as these don't exceed 49% of the final product. 51% still has to be real cheese. When Kraft started to add in the milk protein concentrate, which they knew wasn't one of the approved ingredients, importantly, they kept the name the same, despite this no longer being allowed. Incredibly, no one noticed until 2002, when during a routine inspection, the FDA noticed that this unknown ingredient was being added into Kraft singles. Huh. Understandably a bit upset, they gave Kraft an ultimatum either remove this product from the cheese, or you had to stop calling it cheese, at least the federally regulated terms of cheese. You know, a lot of the cheaper brands, um, it'll say imitation processed cheese. And, and that's because it's got more of those uh, weird ingredients and, and less than the 51% of actual cheese. So it still has some cheese in it, but they call it imitation, like pasteurized processed imitation cheese food or something like that. Kraft went with this second option, quietly rebranding themselves from food to product, a legally meaningless term, allowing them to continue adding this milk protein concentrate. Really? So pasteurized prepared cheese product. So that's what they're doing now. So that's not even up to the actual regulation. Wow. Because, wow. I mean, I knew it wasn't like technically real cheese. I knew it was like prepared with other, you know, cut with other ingredients, but it's still not even done the way it, it's supposed to be done. That's pretty crazy to me. Other companies which had also been using the ingredient did the same. And I've had a lot of fun going around my local supermarket to see which cheeses are legally cheese. Okay, so we have regulated by standard of identity. Happy Farms Deluxe Slices. So pasteurized processed cheese. Yeah, Kraft Deluxe, Deli Deluxe American. Uh, let's see. 
value time. That's what I'm talking about right there. Imitation, pasteurized, processed cheese food. Yep. So that's... Wow, because see, there's some people that would actually take the craft singles over the value time because... And, and, and we think that this is the same category as the, the standard over here, but it's not. Like, there's people that would choose the craft, uh, the one that's not regulated, over the value time that's not regulated because the value time says imitation. So a lot of people think it's way lower quality, but yet it's in the same category. Wow. And then like right here, Horizon Organic, it says American Singles Pasteurized Processed Cheese Product. I thought that that was a different, I thought that that was better than like, you know, say the value time right here, but it's not. It's in the same category. Wow. Eye-opening, guys. Eye-opening. And which other ones are entirely made up. American cheese isn't cheese, but I don't think it has to be. It's got us through two world wars and brought affordable cheese consumption to the masses. The same masses who today have caused a renaissance in local specialty cheese production. And who knows, when the apocalypse finally does arrive, perhaps it'll be cans of bright orange cheese which pull us through the Thunderdome. <laughs> Until then, this has been James Dingley from the Atomic Frontier. Keep looking up. Wow, that was a that was an interesting video. Like I learned I learned a lot from that. I know what to look for now when I go to the store if I'm going to go get the regular cheese slices. It makes it is whether it's technically cheese or not, it still tastes good, okay? It's still good. It's not it's it doesn't compare to real cheese. We all know that. I know that. But it's its own product, its own thing and its own right and it is great on a ham sandwich. It's great on grilled cheese. Or, you know, if you cook up some sausage and eggs, throw a slice of that on there, put it on your biscuit or your croissant or whatever, and uh, it just melts real nice, and, and it does taste good. But, yeah, it's not real cheese, which I didn't think it was, but it's still... So there's no difference between the basic craft and the other stuff that says imitation. That is something I learned today. So if you guys learned, also hit like, drop a comment down below. Let me know what you think about this and uh, consider subscribing if you enjoy this content. I do all sorts of different reactions and stuff. So uh, yeah, I'll catch you guys in the next one. Have a super fun, awesome day. Take care.